I, I thought it would be important to share that with you because it draws attention to a number of things. One being the work of several of our students who happen to be dreamers. They're part of the Dream Act generation that are undocumented but are seeking an, an earned path to citizenship. These are kids who were valedictorians in their high school, salutatorians, and didn't know where to go to school. But somehow, someway, our university has earned the reputation that that's where you go. They welcome you there. They support you there. They encourage you there. And you graduate from there. Fresno Pacific University enjoys the great privilege of being the only four-year Christian liberal arts university in the entire Central Valley. And we have the highest graduation rates of any college or university in the Central Valley. And so these student leaders are taking it upon themselves to educate, to lead, to inspire, to challenge and motivate the rest of us to not only stay informed, but to remain in touch. And so Jose, who's on the bus on his way here, put this together. And several of our students who are on that bus were actually in these images. They pick fruit. They pick vegetables. Their parents were also depicted in these images. And yet these humble parents who pick fruit and vegetables for a living save money to send their kids to a four-year Christian university. It's absolutely inspiring and amazing some of the things that they are doing. And that's the context into which I have been challenged to apply and practice Luke chapter 4. That's the context that God has placed my family. And when we think about Fresno, and honestly didn't think much about it prior to our being there, simply because when you're born and raised in the big city, like we were, you just don't think much about the small towns, particularly those in the Central Valley. But Fresno happens to be the fifth largest city in the state of California. But regretfully, it also has the highest rate of concentrated poverty in the United States. It's got one of the highest rates of unemployment, homelessness, and crime. It also has one of the lowest percentages of degree attainment in the entire state of California. And when you look at the counties that are lower than Fresno County, they are all there within very close proximity. And yet we know that the Central Valley produces 20% of the world's food. Not just the state of California's food, but the world's food. And then when we think in terms of the students that come to our university, half of our students are first generation college attending. They are their first in their family to go to school. Whether it's City College, many of them start out at Fresno City College or Reedley or College of the Sequoias, but ultimately they make their way to our university. 96% of all students attending my university are receiving some form of financial aid. 96. The diversity of the Central Valley is truly reflected at our university in culture. We have virtually every ethnic group represented on our campus. We have over 40 nations represented on our campus. And because the Central Valley is religiously conservative, we have a very strong representation from both Roman Catholic and Protestant churches. And because we do not require our students to sign a faith statement, we have kids from all religions and worldviews represented on our campus. And that is what has made our call there so unique. And so we understand that we have challenges. We understand that we have opportunities to apply the truths of the gospel, to live out and fulfill the mission of Jesus right in our own backyard. And so our university has fallen back heavily on its core commitments. And one of the things that I have been the beneficiary of, of course, is almost 70 years of, of education and service in that community. But the core principles of Fresno Pacific University are actually built on principles that go back even further. They go back to 
Menno Simons, whose name, of course, Mennonites and Mennonite brethren derive, and articulates the core commitments like this, that true evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. It clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. It comforts the sorrowful. It shelters the destitute. It serves those that harm it. It binds up that which is wounded. It has become all things to all people. And these are the core commitments. These are the core understandings that move us, that motivate us, that animate us, that give meaning and purpose to our programs, to the people we hire, to the way we talk about what we do, to the students we admit, and to our overall mission. And so it's not uncommon on our campus to hear shalom theology spoken by everyone, a strong emphasis on shalom, things as they ought to be, not just in relationships, which is a significant part of shalom, reconciliation, but also in well-being, health, and prosperity. These are our core themes that are talked about regularly as part of our own kingdom proclamation. It's impossible to ignore the challenges that are around us. And so we have made wholehearted commitments to delivering a holistic message and proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is impossible for us to talk about the gospel and not talk about imitating Jesus himself in his work and in his deeds. And so as I think about this theme and its implications for us as campus leaders, whether you are a college president, administrator, faculty member, student, staff member, whatever your call, whatever your role, there are implications for all of us. Now for me, I've been fortunate to have been steeped in this work for quite a bit of time prior to my administrative call. And so when I think in terms of my own personal commitment to the work of diversity and reconciliation, I'm asked that quite often. And I basically have four responses to that question. And so if I were to sum up my own reasons why I am committed to this, my first and foremost commitment is rooted in my own understanding of what it means to be a child of God and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so I believe that part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus is imitating Christ. And so if we want to know how to live, we simply look at what Jesus did. We listen to his words and we seek to emulate and imitate his practice. And if you simply do that, you will find yourself gravitating to the poor, to the oppressed, to the weak, to the underclass, the powerless, the marginalized, and those on the outskirts. But there's also a biblical basis for this. And of all the many things I am so grateful to Biola University for, you don't spend 18 years at the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, not as a student. If you were here for 18 years, there's a problem there. We have some <laughs> counselors and advisors standing by ready to help you. But continue writing those tuition checks. <laughs> but we have wrestled here on this campus with the biblical basis for why we do what we do. How do we inform our own personal commitment to diversity? But beyond that, how do we do that corporately? How do we do that as a community? How do we do that as a university community? How do we do that as members of the board of trustees, as those who have been given senior leadership responsibilities? And of course, we just work that all the way through the entire university. We understand that there is a biblical basis. There is a biblical mandate to practice the works of Jesus. And we just read that in Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. But then there's another dimension to this, and it has to do with calling. And I believe that there are times when we simply don't choose the work. The work chooses us. And I can't help but think that somehow, some way, God has purposed for me to be involved in 
this kind of work. And I have taken that very, very seriously. As I reflect on my own life, as I reflect on my influences, as I reflect on my, my upbringing and simply the way God has led me, the way God has led our family in this last year, we have been able to document miracles that have borne witness to our needing to leave Biola University and all of the comfort and the privilege and the benefit and the blessing that I have enjoyed here to lead a university in the midst of a valley that is in great need, yet at the same time has been called the Mennonite Brethren Church's gift to the Central Valley. And so I enjoy the great privilege of taking the leadership of a university that has proven itself by walking the walk that it talks. And that has been a tremendous, tremendous uh, blessing for me because the needs are great. And that's the fourth reason. If we didn't have pain and suffering, if we didn't have brokenness, if we didn't have disease and sickness and war in our midst, we'd have nothing to do. I think that's called heaven. And we're not there yet. And so on this side of heaven, there are desperate needs everywhere around us. And if we are filled with God's spirit, we understand that we have a responsibility to, re to address and alleviate need to the best of our ability, even as we proclaim the kingdom. And then as I think in terms of a second implication, it's the sacred nature of academic leadership. Recently, I was introduced to a book by Bowman and Gallows titled, Reframing Academic Leadership. And in this book, they actually use the language of sacredness to identify the work of a university president. And that is not new. In fact, that kind of language is making its way into the leadership literature on a more regular basis. But when you begin to think in terms of Christian call and vocation, and the fact now that experts in leadership are holding out the role of the president of a university of college as that of sacred, it gets our attention. And so as it talks about the sacred nature of the presidency, it makes reference to it in this way. The president's work is multidimensional. Its impact goes well beyond campus boundaries, and it always requires the courage to embrace change. And right there in that statement is the definition of leadership. It challenges boundaries. It embraces change. It requires courage. And when you begin to think in terms of all of those dimensions that make leadership what it is, these are just a few of the areas that have been identified in this particular volume. That of analysts, we, we expect our leaders to be problem solvers. Social architects, we expect our leaders to be able to bring together communities of people and to focus them and direct them and to provide leadership to them. We expect our leaders to be political in regard to making connections and providing advantage to a particular institution like a university. We expect these leaders to be prophets. And again, this is taken from the leadership literature. This is not a Christian book. It talks about leaders being artists and having to do their work with flair. And it has to do with the particular values we ascribe and attribute and desire in our leaders. And then leaders are expected to be servants, servants of all. Presidents are to be at the service of others. And then I added spiritual leader. After all, this is SCORE in Biola and it's a Christian university. But beyond that, this represents my own sense of identity because when I think about all of the training and all of the preparation I have received over the years, the one area that I continue to come back to is my work as a local church pastor. And you know, when you think in terms of the reference that we read in Luke 4, the first statement Jesus made, of course, he's reading Isaiah, is that the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And do you realize that there are no less than seven references to the prominence of the Holy Spirit 
between Luke chapter 1 and that statement in Luke chapter 4. Luke begins with a reference to the Holy Spirit conceiving the child Jesus in chapter 1. At the end of chapter 1, it makes reference to Jesus growing in the Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 2 that revealed to Simeon the prophet the Messiah. In his baptism, Jesus received the Spirit of God in the form of a dove. And after his baptism, the Bible says in Luke chapter 4 verse 1 that he was full of the Spirit. And as a result of his being full, he was then led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. And then he returned in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit at the end of his 40 days of temptation. And then lastly, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so I don't treat lightly that role, that nature, that aspect of leadership that requires a spiritual dimension to this work. Because those of you who have been in this work for any length of time know that you need the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your call in the work of diversity and reconciliation. We need the Spirit of God at work in healing hearts, in mending relationships. We need His wisdom. We need His strength. And so this aspect of spiritual leadership has become critically, critically important and for me as a president, it has implications for all that I do. And when I think in terms of how do we reconcile kingdom proclamation with the outward expression of the gospel, I think that there are at least four things we must consider, and I want to close with this. There has to be unity. There has to be harmony. There has to be congruence between our proclamation and our message. You simply cannot quote a verse of scripture and expect your words to contradict. Your message, your words, the things you say, the things you do must be in congruence with the proclamation of God's kingdom. And then of course, there's the congruence between proclamation and our actions. Our actions have to be consistent with our message and with the content of our proclamation. It's a simple assessment. It's a simple test. Are the things you do addressing the needs of the poor, the oppressed, those who are blind, those who are sick, those who are in need? And then our kingdom proclamation must be in congruence with our mission as Christian colleges and universities. And again, my role as university president is to be the holder and the caretaker of the ministry, the mission, the values of our institution. That is my sacred trust. That is my responsibility. And so one of the things I take very seriously as president is when I talk about the mission of my university is to always tie it to this proclamation of Jesus and to always keep diversity and reconciliation and shalom and the work of alleviating pain and suffering and providing compassion and food and clothing and shelter to those in need there right at the core of who we are as a university. And then lastly, is the kingdom proclamation congruent, consistent with our leadership? As each of you here this afternoon think in terms of your own leadership, again, you may not have a title you may not be a president, but you have influence. You have a voice. Again, the needs are great. They are everywhere around you. And it's important for us that we evaluate and that we reassess everything we do and everything we say to bring it into alignment with the proclamation of God's kingdom. And I believe that as we do that, we will find ourselves in a good place. To say that this transition for, for Virginia and me has been easy is, is, is it's been difficult. It's been challenging. Uh, I got homesick really bad, like about three months into it. And I secretly drove into Los Angeles and just <laughs> took it all in. <laughs> and then drove back to Fresno. But the fact is, Virginia and I know with, without a shadow of a doubt that God has called us serve this wonderful university. 
people that are so precious, they're so simple and humble, it's refreshing. And they educate us. They teach us. I came in and I was labeled a diversity expert and I struck that from the record immediately. Don't ever call me an expert in diversity. When I have students who work in the fields, when I have students whose parents work in the fields, when I work with staff whose parents worked under and were liberated by the work of Cesar Chavez, I have nothing to teach them. They have everything to teach us. And Virginia just recently took one of these young ladies in that pit collage out to lunch and she was struck by her prayer. Because we as evangelicals tend to pray for our meals and when we do, we usually start out by something like, Dear Lord, thank you for this meal. And if we are mindful enough, we might actually go one step further and say, and thank you for the hands that have prepared it. These students go one step further and say, Lord, and bless the hands that have picked it. And when we hear a farmer, a grower, give thanks to God for rain, it comes from the depth of a being that is understanding completely that their life and livelihood and the future of our planet is dependent upon the fruit and the vegetables they grow in the dairy that is produced in that Central Valley, and it is life transforming. And so Virginia and I are very much in the process of continuing to be educated in our work, and we're just grateful for the great privilege and the honor of being here this afternoon. And Glenn, thank you once again. God bless you, God bless Biola University, and God bless each of your colleges and universities, and enjoy the rest of the SCORE conference this, uh, this weekend. Thank you very much. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.